I'm Jerry Geronimo Martin, and I'm here at Fort Verde in Camp Verde, Arizona. Uh, here at the Fort Verde Museum, this happens to be the Indian Room, where it's been requested that I make this short documentary or presentation, however you want to have it addressed to you. I'd like to introduce my dog, Samson. I have a service dog who travels with me. In fact, he usually gets more attention than I do. Well, I'm going to step back here. Now I have a podium. And this brick corner is probably my favorite. Because within this corner, we show the scouts. We show the fact that these scouts were mainly of White Mountain Apaches that were commissioned to work for the government and they were paid like any soldier was being paid. But more so, up on the wall here, the Congressional Medal of Honor. Apaches had their own police department, they were to govern themselves. However, uh, that always didn't work out to its uh, finest hour because there were incidences like the Cubico uh, incident and what the result of that is that uh, there were men that were arrested by the Apaches and then those men went to trial and those men uh, did suffer the uh, consequences of actually being hung. Uh, being self-governed and having your own police department did have, have its consequences. At least you had the Indians arresting the Indians uh, instead of uh, uh, having harsh feelings of uh, the white man having an iron fist or a overruling. As you can see here, this is an individual that is uh, supporting the law, the law, and the law. These two particular individuals were the ones that went to trial, were found guilty, and they were hung. I introduced myself, uh, but I will tell you a little bit more about myself real quick, and that is that I am a Banake Apache, along with being a Cherokee Apache. I'm also a Lapan Apache, and I also have Aztec in my uh, lineage. So, but overall, when you put it all together, I'm a Native American. <laughs> I've been called to talk to you guys mainly about Geronimo, because I'm related to him. What I can tell you about Geronimo is that he was a good leader. He was never a chief. He was a wonderful provider as a kid because 
he was a great hunter. He was uh, physically uh, fit, uh, a real competitor, uh, a very brilliant individual because he had learned strategies that were to be uh, admired at even West Point. As you might find out, West Point has shown the different tactics of what they call guerrilla warfare. Those are not guerrilla warfare. Those were the tactics of Geronimo that they learned the hard way. Uh, you had things like uh, camouflage, or you had ambush, where uh, the Indian would bury himself in the ground and knowing that the, the troops were riding by, and then at the right appropriate time, they would come out of the ground and they would have hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, the decoy, they would send somebody out alone and make it look like uh, he did, got discovered, the troops would chase him, and of course they'd always chase him either up on a mountainside or maybe sometimes in a canyon. And there was where the fireworks started, whether it would be bullets or rocks uh, that were deadly uh, on those ambushes. Uh, several tactics that were used. The Apache learned most of his uh, stuff from nature. He learned that the rattlesnake uh, strikes by surprise and then leaves. He knows that the scorpion also hits hard and quick and then leaves. And so that was more the tactic of the Indians was to hit and run. And uh, that was always very effective. Uh, the tribe that I, Geronimo comes from is number one, he was a, a Banake. Then he married into the Chiricahua tribe. And then from the Chiricahua tribe, uh, he had, it, it goes like when you marry the bride, the maiden who becomes your bride, you leave your family and you join the family of the bride. And that happened to Geronimo, except Geronimo was uh, the man of the house. His father had passed away. And after passing away, uh, Geronimo had his mother and his sister to take care of. And so he didn't have a head of family, but he provided uh, lots of game uh, to the tribe. Uh, at the age of 14, had graduated from being a brave to becoming a warrior. He finally made his successful uh, fourth time uh, completing his uh, uh, apprenticeship and two things he gained. He gained a new name. He gained a name of Goyathle, which is the wise one. His birth name was Goyakla. Goyakla is oh, he who yawns. Uh, so his name change w was vital. Uh, he had gotten a new status with a, a new name and had been recognized as being very wise. And then he went on to uh, a very interesting story I'm sure you'll find interesting is that he fell in love. He fell in love with a young lady named Lupe. She was of the Cherokee tribe. And he talked to the dad because he didn't have a father. He was the head of the family and said that he wanted to know what it would take to marry this woman, and what the daughter he was, in other words. And the father said, oh, at least six horses. Uh, Geronimo thinking that that was kind of low. He would up it to 16 horses. Now, the dad agreed. But then when he went home and told his sister what he had done and what he was about to do, she was upset with him because she was dating a close friend and his name was Jew or J-U-H or Hugh, however you want to pronounce it. And that uh, she really wanted to marry him. And now Geronimo, her brother, is going to make it impossible for them to, to wed because he's made such a, a, an apostrous uh, goal of uh, 16 horses, come on. Nobody could do that. He was just graduated from being a brave to a warrior. The raids, he was junior. 
got him junior, junior. So anything that was taken uh, from raids, he would have the leftovers. He didn't have seniority. So when he told his sister and his mother, and he also got uh, you involved on this, he said, I'm gonna leave for a while because I'm gonna do raids myself to uh, get what I, I, is necessary for me to marry my love, Lute. So what he did is he went on his own, went on raids everywhere, was gone for a long time, had been uh, capturing the horses in a, a box canyon, and he finally had what he thought was enough. So when he returned, he returned to the camp, went to the dad, Lopez's father, and he brought with him 14 horses. Well, dad comes out and said, you know, the agreement was 16. He counted and he said, there's only 14 there. He says, oh, wait, wait. he says, uh, uh, I have your other two. Where did the other two come from? Jew. Jew came with two fine horses to ask for the uh, hand of Geronimo's sister. So now what do you have? You have 16 horses. And immediately upon that, Geronimo took the hand of his Lupe and they went off to his new home. Now up until this time, things were pretty peaceful. They pretty much had everything to themselves. Uh, they were nomads, they moved around and they had a large, large uh, territory to move in and about. Geronimo never, ever considered the U.S. Army or the government to be his enemy. He only had one enemy, and that came out to be the Mexicans. And just to let you know how that came about is the next story. The next story entails them going down to Mexico to a small town and on a peace journey. On this peace journey, they were going to do some trading, and so this was a, a normal trip that they took the whole family and everyone went down. They went into town and they left their camp basically unprotected because they were on a peace mission. They were greeted by the mayor. Uh, the mayor decided that he was going to have a party. They had a nice big party and people got drunk and, uh, well, they didn't come around until the following day and they found something was not right. They found themselves in the buildings and then they found everything too quiet. They went outside because they couldn't even hear the dog barking and they discovered that the horses were gone and the only thing that was blowing was the wind uh, blowing up dust and dirt and so they got bad feelings and they started back to their camp. Well, they were met with some of the people that were at the original camp and they were told that they had been attacked by the army and that their provisions had been stolen, their horses, everything, and there were a lot of people that were dead. Uh, the chief at the time said they would go back to Arizona and they said, what about our dead? And they said, no, we're not going to uh, do that and go there because I'm sure they're in waiting to ambush us because that's what we would do. So we're not, we're going to leave the dead behind, but we will retaliate once we get grouped back together in Arizona. Geronimo and one other they went to examine for themselves. They snuck in and they took a tally of the damage. And this is where Geronimo found that his mother had been slain. He found that his wife, Lupe, had been slain. And they found that his three children also had been slain. Without any word of no tears, no moaning, no groaning, no sign of grief, he silently went back to Arizona. At that time, he went up on a mountain, prayed to Yusin, his creator, and the wind spoke to him in his ear and told him that he would be invincible, that no bullet would kill him. With that, he returned to the tribe as they met. He was on the war council, and always had been, and they said that he would be the leader of the retaliation because he had suffered the most on the massacre. Once they got there, they lined themselves up on a mountain edge, 
over the town. So when that general saw what he had, knew why they were there, got his troops gathered up, and they rode right out to the river. And when they got to the river's edge, when they were about to cross the river, they saw Geronimo on the other end of the river, only banning a, a knife, shouting out obscenities to them. So the general said, okay, line up two columns, cross, top column, take the higher ground, the lower ones stand below, and start with the bottom. And he said, fire. And so they shot bullets at Geronimo. Then he said, fire again. And that's when the top guys uh, on the line fired out there. Then Geronimo gave the charge yell. And the Indians came from the sides and from behind them. And then there was a, a separate uh, uh, clubs and arrows and uh, uh, guns that were used to fight with. And they were killing all of these Mexicans at the time. And they were yelling out, Jeronimo, Jeronimo, which happened to be their patron saint. Once the battle was over, Geronimo had come across while the battle was ensuing and he'd gotten wounded, but he was not uh, killed or ever killed. In fact, on uh, several battles, he had been once knocked out and left for several days, for left for dead. Uh, he'd been shot in the arm, he'd been shot in the leg, he'd been uh, hit in another leg with a lance. Uh, he got uh, on his side, he was hit with a, a sword. Uh, he'd been wounded, but uh, he, he was a tough old bird. He really was. But now, as he came across, the victorious cry came out from the Indians, and they were calling Geronimo, Geronimo, it start, it's an H sound, Geronimo, Geronimo. And so that was how he actually became Geronimo, because G-E-R-O-N-I-M-O is Geronimo. So he took that name because it was given to him on a victory cry. He had been on a reservation three times. One time he was there, they had rode in and they had were celebrating the ghost dance and the army rode in and they shot the medicine man and, and a, a wounded a lot of other people. And with that, Geronimo left, but he did return. Then, Another time they were celebrating again and they were using Teswin, which is a, a, a liquor that's made from corn. And today, if you were saying uh, liquor was used out east, it was called white lightning or moonshine. Uh, the army said, you can't do that. You can't celebrate. You can't use this uh, fermented uh, drink uh, while celebrating. And so uh, again, he got upset and he left. Probably the final third time was the one that got him in the biggest amount of trouble was because while being on the, back on the reservation, because he did go back again, he, coming with winter time, went to the agent, said, you're getting supplies for us. We want blankets because this is going to be a cold winter and we need to, uh, cover ourselves with, with warm blankets. The agent said, go away, get out, get out of here, go back to your wiki ups and uh, uh, just scat. That following night, Geronimo broke into the warehouse, took the blankets that were actually for them, but since they had been in that warehouse, they had been stamped with U.S. property on it. And he took it out, back out of the warehouse, took it to his people, and then the following morning, the agent goes to the warehouse, finds that it had been broken into, and he says, oh, I know who did this. So he goes to the authorities, the army, and he says, a warehouse has been broken into, and I know the perpetrator is Geronimo. There are other Indians around who overheard this conversation, and they took off to find Geronimo, while meanwhile, the army is gathering up their men, saddling up their horses, and etc. And they got the Indians, found Geronimo, and they told him what was going on. They said, 
they know that you took the blankets and they're going to come and they're going to arrest you. They're going to go through court and then they're going to hang you. And that's when Geronimo says, no, I'm not, that's not going to happen. And of course, that is not what happened. He did leave. And upon that is when the posters on Geronimo were printed for the first time on his, for his arrest. Uh, most people think that the, those posters were put out because of uh, uh, massacres on the settlers or so forth so on. Uh, but it, actually, the original posters that, and the award or reward for Geronimo was not for that at all. What it was for was his stealing of U.S. Army blankets. Now, what Geronimo did do is he, he snuck back to the reservation and he wanted recruits. He wanted his freedom. He wanted to go back on the outside and be self-governed, to be move around uh, like he's always been, have his freedom. Except his freedom now was costly because he was a fugitive. His followers were now considered renegades or hostiles because instead of their raids being raids against other tribes, the raids were now going to be posed on the uh, ranchers and the settlers and they needed provisions and this was their way of getting ammunition and uh, whether they could hunt on their own or not, uh, they needed a way to live. And so this is how they wound up doing it, which wound up good for a long time. But then here in Puerto Verde, this fort right here, we had General Crook, who went to negotiate with Geronimo to give up, come back, and on the negotiation he told Geronimo to surrender, be a prisoner for two years, and those that followed him would be arrested, and they would be moved out of state only for two years, and then they would return back to Arizona. Geronimo said he'd think about it, but what happened after that was short-lived because he was told by a bootlegger that was there with a crook that they would get him across the Rio Grande on the north side and they would hang him. Uh, he wasn't going to have that. So Crook returned without Geronimo. Cook was replaced uh, by General Miles. General Miles found that there was a Lieutenant Gatewood who had known Geronimo. In fact, he was the first one to uh, escort Geronimo to the reservation the first time. Uh, offered his troops of 5,000 and, and Gatewood said no, and all he needed was two Cherokee Apaches and a white flag, and then he would uh, track Geronimo down, which he did, negotiated with Geronimo, told him about how bad things were on the reservation because things were going on on the reservation that were not good, and it was all due to retaliation for him not being on the reservation. So Geronimo went ahead and gave up, became a prisoner of war, uh, was first taken to trial, but then the President of the United States said, no, no trial, but it's going to happen. He was going to be a prisoner of war and that he would be uh, escorted out of Arizona. Uh, he went to, he and his people went to Alabama, uh, they went to Pennsylvania, uh, they wound up in uh, uh, Florida, uh, St. Augustine, Florida, in the catacombs. And then finally Comanches in Fort Sill said that they would give them a home. And they did, so he wound up in Fort Sill. At that time, he uh, tried and escaped. Uh, he done a lot of things uh, besides that. He became an entrepreneur. He did things like sell his buttons, feather on his hat, at, at train stops. Uh, he, so as an entrepreneur, he learned how to make money. While he was a prisoner of war, he made bow and arrows and sold those. Uh, he was a, a focal point uh, on a lot of things like uh, uh, president Theodore Roosevelt's inauguration when he became president. Uh, he was also into the World's Fair. Uh, he was definitely in the limelight. But after 29 years, he begged the government if they were going to take the retaliation on him to do that, but to let the people return to Arizona. 
And so what happened is that that didn't happen. So on a feeble attempt to leave on his own, which he was always guarded, he stole the horse one night and rode off a ravine. The horse was killed. He was partially in the creek and out of the creek. And this is in winter in February. He caught pneumonia and he died from pneumonia. And that was in February 16, 1909. And, but the legend, his leadership, his quest is still remembered. His surrender was the end of all of the Indian Wars. The final finale was Geronimo's surrender. We come from a long, long line of our ancestors in whole that are, have a lot of pride. We're very, very, very brilliant and smart. We're innovators. We can take something new and make it work for us. As an example, we started out with stone knives. After the Spaniards came up and showed us how we could use metal, we started using metal. We, we saw them with their swords, you know, those long knives. Well, we finally got them shortened up, and then later on we had short knives. And then we finally had, they had the muskets. We learned how to use their, their weapons that they were using on us. We turned around and tried to adapt to use that same weapons against them. My grandmother, I would call her little grandma, who, who was from the San Carlos Reservation, taught me that knowledge is power. You can never be too smart. And that to always be proud of, number one, what I am. I am a native. I am the people of the land. But for me to become the person that I'm going to be is up to me. No one else. Well, it's been enjoyable talking to you guys and I hope this finds you all well and good there in Cells, Arizona. So if any time, Feel free to have your teacher uh, uh, get in touch with me and hopefully maybe sometime in the future I can make a personal appearance and come down and see you guys in person. You think of that?